Saludos amigos, Welcome tripulantes friends, de nuestra querida, contaminada y única spacecraft. La misma que desde la última vez que nos vimos por la vez que nos vimos por su imaginario y por supuesto turned on its imaginary axis and of course continues developing events in plena de Sabal. Our agenda is full. Pero hablando académico, que acá tenemos Talking about uh, academicians, we have a very important one here. With me is Ramón Grossfogel, sociology, the origin of decolonization that represents our sister island of Puerto Rico, with which I have very interesting remarks. Reminders. He, was, he is part of uh, modernity, colonialty, and its, uh, University of Puerto Rico. He proposes a critical view of the apparatus assembled from an anti-radical essentialism. We are going to have to educate on these terms, and uh, we will take advantage of this hour. And uh, he has also deepened in the topic of sovereignty, which in Puerto Rico is essential, global reason reasoning colonialism in Puerto Rico and decolonization of economy seen from another geopolitics and colonialty of power. Almost anything. Because talk of independent Puerto Rico is a direct confrontation with Washington at any time. Welcome aboard. Thank you for your invitation. For me, it's a pleasure and honor. It is reciprocal. Tell us how the situation is. Well, the situation in the island is very difficult because, as you know, the, it has been intervened before the hurricane. It was intervened by a board organized from Washington where they impose, direct, and control all the local bu budget for the island. There is no sovereignty, not even on the bu budget. It's an appendix of Washington, with all due respect, regarding the essential elements of sovereignty. Of course, Puerto Rico has no sovereignty. It's a colony in the most classical sense of the term. In this sense, Washington and the Congress decides upon it uh, to the point that when the local government has a fiscal government and is unable to pay the debt, Washington intervenes immediately with a board that conducts and controls the local budget in a unilateral way. And of course, they've closed hundreds of schools, hundreds of hospitals. <laughs> but is it, it is true? Yes, that was the unfatigable work of Puerto Ricans to assure basic uh, services. They have closed them? Yes, because we first have to uh, pay Wall Street bondists and uh, shareholders of the government. Once they pay them, whatever is left is for the people's needs. So we are under an intervention, a direct intervention of the empire on the island in an unfair and brutal way because the people is, are suffering in the island. They uh, talk about uh, a lot about uh, on the press saying many lies about many things, but the press never says what is happening in Puerto Rico. Since it's a colonial U.S. colony, everything is concealed for the rest of the world. But people are suffering hunger, famine in Puerto Rico, and Mr. Trump uh, has made a policy of discrimination towards the island because the hurricane came that destroyed a large uh, part of the island's infrastructure, and this uh, filled the glass of what had been happening, complete uh, unhappiness. This White House uh, 
Okay. Well, what he did when he came to Puerto Rico, he uh, threw toilet paper to the people. You can't be so rude. And when I saw that, I, I asked the people to repeat that image because I couldn't believe it. The guy throwing toilet paper to the people. Yes, and the message is a message to the people who vote him in the United States. It's like telling the white supremacist racists that vote for Trump, look how I treat these animals. That was the message. We are the wasps, yes, the superiors, and I'm going to treat these people in this way. That message was direct to the people who vote for him, for, to his voters. Well, I couldn't believe that. You see that, and what animal is this type? But at the same time, there are raci racist imperial reasoning behind that. It's for his voters. When talking about colonization, we have been working here with the topic of decolonization during this week uh, in the third uh, school of decolonizing thought. Clarify the decolonizing thought. It seems like a neologism, but it has deep roots. Many people get confused because the topic is not that when we talk about decolonizing, many people think we're talking about the moment when Latin American countries reached independence from an empire. So they ha reach an independent state. The topic is much deeper because when we talk about decolonization, we refer to something much deeper. We're talking about all that domination hierarchy that was formed globally and regionally, nationally through a long colonial history that made uh, the next day after independence the dominating hierarchy of the capitalistic system, Western modernity, didn't change domination structures. I refer to the fact that a colonial country where labor is, was subordinated to the metropolitan center under the capitalistic division of work, and you exported uh, one of the products the day after the independence, they were doing the same. They weren't decolonized from the capitalistic division of work. Centuries after independence, we still have uh, this colonial uh, structure that was formed during centuries of colonization in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Uh, in any war, the United States mobilized Puerto Ricans to defend uh, the U.S. flag where there was uh, mandatory military service for many years. That was eliminating after the Vietnam War. But uh, the topic I was talking is the international division of labor. To clarify what we're talking about decolonization is that the international division of labor was not decolonized after the countries uh, became independent. All the countries that were colonial territories after the independence somehow continued being subordinate to the metropolitan centers that colonized them before. So somehow these metropolitan centers remained as uh, metropolitan centers that control the world's economy, and the rest of the world with independent states are still controlled by the metropolitan centers, whether by uh, economic dependency or because uh, your country has been somehow intervened and you have uh, state structures that are neo-colonial directly or indirectly controlled by the metropolitan centers. But uh, it doesn't stop there. 
It is also our culture, the production of knowledge, as um, our uh, professor, intellectual Enrique Dussel, uh, the other day here, how we started uh, thinking the world from Western categories and how we're looking at our realities that are very different uh, from uh, the Western think uh, think thinkers that uh, they didn't think of ours, but the uh, philosophers that thought our reality, we are always importing ideas of people who never thought what happened here. So we need to decolonize thought knowledge, as Enrique Dussel said, uh, decolonization of education curricula in, from elementary school to universities. We need to decolonize the history because we are importing uh, history tales that are not related to ours. We need to decolonize the way how we think the relation between human beings and other living beings because we have imported a cosmovision that is destroying life. We have to decolonize in certain way of technologies that are so destroy life. So there's a range of things we must think uh, decolonizing. Enrique Dussel, in the conference we had with President Maduro, even in the military uh, level, and he set an example, we must also decolonize the vision of the military because we are importing models that are inconsistent with uh, our realities. So uh, this is a cross-cutting topic, decolonization. It uh, contains many things, and ultimately racism that's another uh, colonial inheritance that is expressed in many at many levels of our daily social political economic life so decolonization is a cross-cutting topic that crosses different spaces of uh, reality. Not all citizens of Puerto Rican goes to the United States and receives an egalitarian treatment. El tema de Puerto Rico. Well, the topic uh, to go back to Puerto Rico because you were talking about decolonization, I was explaining that. Well, you have to exhaust that if you still have, because decolonization is much broader in the sense that the Puerto Rico's reality as a colony at this historic time is quite exceptional because colonial administrations have been practically eradicated around the world. So colonialism in a classic sense it almost does not exist in the rest of the world. It doesn't mean it has disappeared, that colonial domination has disappeared, or structures produced after centuries of colonial history have disappeared centuries after independence. So the topic of decolonization goes beyond uh, uh, the existence of a colonial administration or not. And the myth of the 20th century used to think that because colonies have disappeared around the world, the re colonial relations also disappeared. This is a great myth of the 20th century, exhaust the idea of colonial domination according to the existence or not of colonies. The problem is that uh, they colonized and controlled the, the entire planet during those centuries. They built global domination hierarchies at the economic, political, cultural, epistemological, ecological, pedagogical, space, geographic. Uh, when you look at the range of activities of human beings, they touched every way of living and existing. So there is a coloniality in the way we think and uh, we are, how we think, how we are in the world. 
Uh, all this was colonized by our imaginary, our ways of being, and that is central if you want to think in a revolutionary project that uh, makes radical ruptures with the system we are in. It's not only an economic, capitalistic, exploitive uh, model, but it's an entire civilization that covers a broad range of domination that are not exhausted, are not limited only to economic, but uh, it is crossed by these destructive reasoning of life. So colonialism is a core to understand a revolutionary process. But uh, in case of a war, Puerto Ricans are mobilized immediately by Washington. Regarding Puerto Rico, I would say that uh, when it's about war, historically, Puerto Rico was the bait of the 20th century. Puerto Ricans were always recruited for wars since the First World War and recruitment was mandatory. My grandfather uh, found out he was a U.S. citizen the moment he received the letter where they compelled him to go to the First World War or he would be arrested. So many young Puerto Ricans found out they were U.S. citizens because they were being sent to war. The value of citizenship was zero. It was sending you to get killed. Then came Vietnam War. After that, they eliminated the mandatory service. And the U.S. Army is uh, composed by poor people, people who have no alternative, alternative and uh, end up in the Army. And that makes Puerto Rico as an impoverished territory go to the Army seeking a way of living because the situation is very bad in the, uh, on the island. And through that, is there the possibility of scholarships to study after serving for the military? For many years, there was service for the war veterans because if you survived, and if you survived in conditions to study because uh, the case of people who died or with mental uh, disorders was huge. Those who came out physically and psychologically well had programs for education, etc. But many of those programs have been eliminated. So, Iraq veterans uh, complain a lot because they were part of the anti-war movement in the United States, which uh, uh, is composed by veterans of the wars. After they saw what the war is, uh, they became anti-war activists. So many patriots uh, disappear in the Hollywood version is no. Well, in the empire, there will be important demographic changes in the 20th, 21st century. The other day, I mentioned uh, this, uh, the growth of Latin Hispanic populations, white uh, populations are becoming minorities, and there's an internal struggle struggle in the empire in terms of the future of the empire, the forces who want to impose some, some kind of apartheid and they know they are min minorities and they're concerned about controlling majorities, the, minority, the majorities will be non-whites and that is happening in most of U.S. states and political and social forces that seek to decolonize the empire from the inside. We, we don't uh, receive many of the internal struggles because the media do not uh, repeat them, but there are very strong struggles inside the empire, and this is what causes the reaction of Trump's movement as a white supremacist uh, movement. This guy seems Ku Klux Klan. Many people thought they disappeared, but they have been 
They are all the life. They have organized politically uh, because they have been defeated politically through the civil rights movement in the 60s. They came back with force and have reorganized, claiming inside the empire uh, uh, and apartheid solution. Uh, in the fact they are losing in the international uh, arena and domestically in the United States as well. So we're talking about uh, uh, decadent power. We were talking about the international side, but there is uh, an internal side. Uh, that is related to the struggle for the hegemony, the empire, a state that has been racist, is being disputed strongly by the demographic growth of uh, non-white populations. So this makes uh, rea the domestic reaction was strong, and they have reorganized something that seemed to have disappeared, disappeared like Ku Klux Klan and all the supremacist uh, movements, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, Anglo-speaking and non-Catholic Protestant. So this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> While they can recruit the people for the war, that's okay. But the problem is that uh, today the empire is not uh, the empire of the 20th century. We're talking about a decadent empire. How does the decadence uh, show in daily life? Internally, decadence in the United States is expressed, to give you an example, in 2008, when the financial crisis started, between 2008 and 2012, 12 million U.S. families lost their homes. We're talking about white U.S. working class who lost their homes and that they were unable to pay the mortgages and with the financial crisis, they lost their uh, uh, homes, 12 million families and people. If we make a modest calculation, three people by family, we're talking about 36 million peoples on the, people on the streets. That happened in the Nazi Germany in the 30s. What does the system do in times of crisis of this type? It immediately mobilizes racism of all the, the permanent because they try to make the worker victim of a, a capitalist system blame or channel their unhappiness, not against the Wall Street that uh, robbed uh, so much during that crisis, but against the migrants who cross the borders, against the black citizens, against uh, Hispanic citizens, and they channel, as they did in the in the 30s in the Nazi uh, Germany and many t places of Europe to uh, racially inferiorized groups. So this is a way of the capitalist system of deviating attention of the essential and structural problems. So while you have a working class that believes their enemy is another more exploited, more impoverished worker he believes is inferior. The working class will be divided, and those unhappy and impoverished white workers who lost their house channel their rage against uh, uh, the poorest people. That happened in the Nazi Germany, and this is happening in the fascist Trump United States. From 
according to Trump's uh, position, he doesn't even take care of his declarations. He breaks the crystals each time he wants. I think uh, we must understand the phenomenon in terms of a movement, a mass movement. Trump has organized a massive social movement. This is why he does not, he continues in Twitter because that's his communication means. Well, he doesn't have a capacity for more than a Twitter. But when you look at Twitter and what he launches through, it. He is uh, giving a political orientation to a mass movement. In the 30s, fascism always mobilized impoverished uh, sectors, giving them hope that since you are a superior race, someday, I promise you, someday you, we will be we will make America great again. That's a slogan. But if you look at the 30s, Hitler, the, uh, the mechanism he used was a speech between, uh, in front of thousands of people. And he said terrible things, but it was a mass movement. Impoverished workers in Germany to whom Hitler promised a solution through uh, a sense of nationalism, racist nationalism versus other populations inside and outside Germany. It, the, Trump is the same, but Trump does not mobilize people in a plaza, but with Twitter. Every morning he communicates with that movement. And that movement is organized. Trump's Twitters are followed by millions of people. But those millions of people, there are thousands politically organizing fascist bands that go around the country and uh, carry out several incidents there where they attack of people as the SS did, and they go in aggressive. They decide to go to a city in different parts of the United States, and they hit people. Then Trump, the police, and the state uh, say they were victims of aggression when truly they went with sticks and everything to uh, hit people, so they created chaos. But they go to sectors identified as left uh, and with people with non-white population, this reminds me the German Nazi of the 30s when the SS appeared in the cities, hitting all Jews. They went to Jewish uh, neighborhoods and they attacked people. The version is that was that the Jews had attacked them. This reminds me clearly of that, but uh, just that we are in a digi digital era that you don't need uh, to appear in a plaza like Hitler did. His mechanism now is Twitter. The people doesn't understand the use of Twitter why this president doesn't uh, leave uh, Twitter in peace, because it, he, people don't, don't understand that Twitter is his communication means. He continues tweeting, uh, regardless of what they tell you, because he gives some certain orientations. What he says, fake news, he is an expert in fake news. He accused President Maduro, the Vice President of the United States, saying that he was, he financed uh, the refugee, the movement, uh, the refugee from Honduras after the coup against Celaya, organized by the empire, and the people is le leaving that country where death is a daily topic. So the people leave as refugees, and so the guy, the speech he's handling is that. Uh, it's President Maduro who is financing a complete law, lie. 
mentiras que las repiten y las repiten y las repiten. But hasta these que are lies repeated until the people believe. Once again, this reminds me of the Nazi uh, Goebbels, who had the terrorist the theory that the more you repeat a lie, the more truth it becomes. And this is what these people do. They repeat a lie until many people in the United States believe it. And then you have the complicity of the media. And a large part of the world, uh, people are, uh, the people in the world are repeating a lie. So we are at a time of fascism that has a series of dimensions uh, that sometimes uh, these governments kept a liberal facade until some time ago, and oh, this is uh, yes, at least they took care of the style. Trump is seeking the vote of a population which uh, he has to comply his promises. So, it's a completely racist uh, vote. So he has to talk in this way for these people to follow him. So he has mobilized the worst of U.S. voters to the point that uh, they mobilized thousands, millions of people, even if he didn't uh, uh, win the, uh, the votes of the people, but uh, the, uh, we're talking about a country that decided not to vote again because they felt that uh, there was no political leader. Trump uh, came and the, he mobilized them. This has happened with some political leaders, extreme right in Europe that uh, mobilizes a, a rhetoric uh, and uh, popular unhappiness to other mi workers, migrants, and, and you have the white the working class that are affected uh, by the crisis, mobilized not against the crisis, but against other workers. For the white workers, uh, they are people who take away uh, your bread. Yes, because the migrants are working in places, in jobs that nobody wants to do. No white worker wants to have the jobs that the uh, migrants do. That's why there is a demand for migrants in spite of the racism and everything. So uh, the uh, racism and xenophobia not, does not fully eliminate these workers. They want to have them, but semi-slaverized. And they come from countries where they were... Uh, colonies like the Maghreb. If you look at Syria and Libya and Af Afghan uh, migration, most of the people who are leaving and crossing what they call the crisis of refugees in Europe, people who come from places where the United States and Europe have intervened militarily, then they come and look they react as if uh, in a completely irresponsible way because they react like, what, is this, the, what are these people doing here? You destroy their country and now that you don't want to receive the people who are fleeing from your bombs. So something similar happens in Honduras. These are people who are leaving a country that has been destroyed through a soft coup, which was the first before in Latin America, before Brazil and Paraguay, where they destroy the government in Celaya and place a regime that has killed uh, more journalists, activists, and people every day than any other regime in Central America. 
And the media barely talk about this. Yes, you have unstabilized a country with an authoritarian regime. You are killing the people, and now you don't want to assume responsibility for the refugees that are leaving. The United States is doing now with the march of refugees from Honduras, but the, Europe does the same with those who cross the Mediterranean seeking how to flee from the war and the bombs of uh, Western imperialistic countries. And they were colonies of those countries. Yes. With the bombs and the war they have created, of course, refugees are going to the countries that caused that. But of course, uh, if that, as if that didn't have to do anything with it. That is how most of the people in the metropolitan are told. What are these people doing here? Why do we have to assume responsibilities for them? That's, you can do it. Why do they saturate health services, education? That's a problem when there is no decolonization of the left in the world. Today, this Western left and Westernized left continues repeating Eurocentric schemes, racist schemes. They reproduce the logics of domination of the right wing. It comes a time when they hold the power in the administration and they repeat the same things of the right, racist, neoliberal, etc. And what happens then is that uh, the subjectivity of the people has not changed. And what happens is that many people who voted for communists and social democrats vote for extreme right now. Why? What happened? That working communist social democrat uh, workers who historically voted for the left now are voting for fascist. What happened there? The political practices and the concepts of the left was not as different as the extreme right. When they held the power positions, they repeated all schemes, capitalist, uh, anti-migrant, racist. The left repeated that. So what happened, somebody like Le Pen comes and says, don't vote. It's a famous uh, fascist, uh, French fascist. And they tell uh, the workers, don't vote the photocopies. They are doing what we have done all the time, and we do it better. We are harder, so vote for us. So the workers vote for them, because when the left governed, they didn't change the minds of the people. So don't get surprised if the next elections or through a process of the terrorization of the countries that the population that voted left will vote right. It's happening all over in the first world, and it's happening in Brazil. People who were voting PT suddenly appear to vote this fascist. So there's a problem of the left. We have to look what is happening with the left that largely have responsibility. I would like you to deepen in this topic because nobody has talked about this. I just want you to think of this. Where is the left sol international solidarity with Venezuela? Venezuela is a country that is uh, interfered where every, all the problems we all know, in Chile, the coup, where the CIA, all this topic of taking the food and first uh, uh, 
basic products for the people to be hungry, then speculate about the prices, create hyperinflation and devaluate the money for the people to suffer hyperinflation and be unhappy against the government and create the conditions for a military invasion, a coup, that we have already seen this. Any leftist knows about this. So the question is what is happening, that they know all this history elsewhere, but in Venezuela they don't know it. It's interesting, I listened to the Minister of Culture, Ernesto Villegas, say, after listening to the decolonizing school this week, he listened to part of the courses, he said, I just noticed something, that in the end, that left ends up being racist, because when it's about a Caribbean country as Venezuela and a president like Maduro or like Chavez, their own racism blinds them. They are looking at the same operations that took place with Argentina or Chile, but since they are, there are wider populations there, it was valid to be solidary there, but here, there's a suspicion that there's something wrong with the government. So they end up by being accomplices of the imperial policy because they reproduce the lies they say about Venezuela. And he was wondering why, because in the end, there's a paradigm that is racist regarding Venezuela. Venezuela is a Caribbean country of indigenous populations, multiracial, it's not a white country like uh, perhaps Argentina or Chile that has at least the image it gives because although we know there are indigenous, indigenous and black people, but uh, they appear as white, whitened country. It's more comfortable uh, for the Western nations to be solidary with them, but when it's about a Caribbean country like Venezuela and Cuba, solidarity is not there. They are always looking at from far away in complicity with their own states and the lies they are saying. So this is serious. It's serious because we're in a moment that uh, is very dangerous uh, of, uh, because of the empire's aggression, a moment of counter-revolution, recolonization of Latin America. And the left is in silence, but let's not go so far to Europe or U.S. Where is La the Latin American left? Where is it regarding solidarity with Venezuela? Venezuela is fenced militarily. There is an economic, political aggression. There is a language that is so old of the so-called humanitarian war. They are using the language and preparing the world uh, opinion. And the Latin American left is in silence with a few exceptions, because we know there are always people that are consistent, the left that are solidary, but we don't see that strength the, we saw when people went out to the streets and there were much more debates. The people in our neighbor countries I've spoken with, left, uh, leftists, the uh, intellectuals that believe the stories of the press because, and I, I'm surprised because uh, it's pathetic. I have had discussions, very strong discussions with intellectuals of the region that start to believe the lies they are saying of Maduro, Venezuela, etc. And I really am surprised. And what this shows is the ideological bankruptcy in the Latin American left. 
because somehow the paradigms we are handling are troublesome. As Enrique Dussel says, the left must be decolonized from its soul models of thought because they are not at the level. They, on the contrary, they are ending up being accomplices of the dominating structures. They do not manage to mobilize the people, not even in solidarity events uh, in favor of Venezuela, but they uh, turn out to be accomplices. The ideological bankruptcy of the world's left you have a left that is behaves like the right when it arrives to power it reproduces the schemes and the problems of the right when you have a left that is not mobilized uh, in solidarity for the countries attacked by imperialism they don't feel as their own the el elementary characteristics of solidarity. Yes, and I am surprised, for example, that Colombian intellectuals with whom I've discussed, leftist, talk to me about uh, and repeat uh, the speech of humanitarian crisis, and they tell me that Venezuelans are arriving here. There are still leftist intellectuals in Colombia because we have six million Colombians receiving education, house, health. No, they don't speak about that. Let, how about if we send six million Venezuelans there? What happened there? What they're doing is articulating because they're repeating what they see in the press. They're being a useful Machiavelli for U.S. invasion, but the electoral campaign, we must say, Petro was the leftist alternative uh, versus the candidate who won. But what did Petro say of Venezuela? He washed his hands. He never assumed a position that is consistent with Venezuela. So they end up being accomplices with the speeches, imperialist, uh, aggressive speeches that uh, appear in the region. And then they cannot. Uh, uh, discuss those speeches because they are accomplices and when you say that there's a humanitarian crisis you don't have a face how can you debate the topic of military aggression if you have participated in the speech of humanitarian war that imperialism is using now to justify military invasion? It's the uh, left bankruptcy, and that needs a renovation, ideological renovation of the left that somehow must uh, say what uh, Enrique Dusselawa says, the need to decolonize our paradigm, and we need new grassroots, yes, a refoundation of the left, because what we have is a leftist is bankruptcy. But it's a shame because uh, they, what the media says has no grounds. It's a way of conciliating with the status quo, a way of not confronting and placing red lines uh, against the system, and somehow seek uh, the votes in electoral campaigns, putting the real topics under the rug. And they believe they're going to win the elections in this way. No, you're the photocopy. You're never going to win elections. You're the photocopy of others. As Le Pen said, the people would, will vote for the originals. You have to renew uh, the speech, uh, refound the left, uh, go back to anti-imperialism, go back to uh, anti-colonialist, anti-capitalist statements. 
but uh, they are gradually giving up. You, when you open uh, your eyes, you're a photocopy, so you have nothing to confront the right. This is pathetic, what is happening. And they are traitors. I, it is me who says this, but these are <laughs> the genetic descendants of Santander. <laughs> when you look at the government of uh, Lenin Moreno in Ecuador, you see a repetition of the same where they are withdrawing everything uh, uh, Correa has of radicals and he betrayed Correa, complete betrayal. I knew them when they were solitary. We were singing. He loved to sing. I have recordings there. And he transformed the genetic political mutation. I think that uh, we must uh, think in refounding the leftist paradigm. We have to renew because they are not working. We must renew. The reality is so harsh you didn't expect it. And I think that Venezuela has a role to play that is very important. We have moral reserves. Oh, yes, you have moral reserves. You have ideological statements. And the experience of having a leader like Hugo Chavez has kept this, because we have a leader that has uh, generated an ideological and political vision with orientation and horizons. Undoubtedly, the role of President Maduro has very important in give, continuing Chavez's project and uh, being skillful enough to take this uh, project, bring this project ahead in very difficult times. I acknowledge this and congratulate him. The fact of having a worker in the presidency that everybody said that uh, is not able, I think that uh, Maduro has shown intelligence before he was a president. That is a classist, elite, uh, racist speech. Uh, against the people. President Maduro had shown his intelligence and genius. And I think uh, the process here continues in spite of all aggressions and all difficulties, in spite of the economic war that has not concluded and still has more ammunition. I think that uh, the future of Latin America is at stake here. This is the example. It is here because uh, it is the bastion in South America that continues on, on their foot with dignity that the empire has not uh, destroyed. And if you see the loss in Argentina and Brazil and Ecuador, there's still Bolivia and Venezuela. And Venezuela is the place that uh, is central because of its uh, geographic and geopolitical location for the rest of the region. Venezuela shall uh, must uh, survive these aggressions. This is central for the future of Latin America. The empire's aggression has been very strong, and it has been generalized for different countries, soft coup, governments that have been defeated, etc. We have a counter-revolutionary offensive in the region and a process of recolonizing the region by the empire. The other day I was saying that it was related with the fact that they have lost the wars in the Middle East and they come seeking to consolidate the historic uh, uh, region of the 19th century of Latin America.
Y, y, y lo que yo decía así desde el comienzo, lo que me preocupa de said, Trump, uh, es que después de ser el capitán de empresa triunfante, uh, I am concerned that, that Trump, Trump, after being the commander of the corporation, he wants to be a head of... Eso es el megalómano que lleva por dentro, coincide con los análisis que... que the commander in chief quiere ser el comandante en jefe que él es lo que viene con el cargo de presidente es peligroso no está he is not prepared and does not measure the consequences viene por ahí muy peligroso y con las siete bases gringas and with the seven us bases and after Colombia granted all its space and we mustn't forget that whatever the U.S. soldier does, they won't punish him. And if you see the crisis of legitimacy, where all masks fall, is in the case of a Washington Post journalist who disappeared in the Saudi embassy in Turkey. Bueno, what do you eh, think of that? Aquí, I think that Oriente, all the Middle East geopolitics are being played there. There's a war lost by uh, the Saudi U.S. Russia, Russia Iran eh, clearly y, won that war. And now there is a balance of force, a different balance of force. Turkey that started by the side of U.S., NATO, and Saudi people left the war closer to the Russian and us because in the process they tried to uh, make a coup against Erdogan, so he made, took the distance from the empires. All the weapons passed through the Turkish border to Syria, and now the people that the empire placed there and uh, what happened was that now, recently, Turkey, after the coup two, year, two or three years ago, took sides with Russia and now has a position of confronting the Axis, the Saudi U.S.-Israeli Axis. I am surprised by Israel's low profile. Para los bocones que han sido y con el poder obvio que tienen, with the power they have, el apoyo del poderosísimo lobby, the support of the powerful pro-Israeli lobby in the United States. The problem is that Israel has been together with the Saudi Arabia in the coup against Egypt, in the Syrian war, the invasion to Yemen. They have been working together. It's a political alliance. And what happened at the embassy in Turkey takes the mask away from the, uh, Saudi Arabia. The son of Prince was being sold as a reformist. As, and Saudi are an autocracy, a monarchy that are completely repressive. The version of Islam Mojave that is completely conservative it has nothing to do with Islam in the rest of the world. And that group and what they did in the Turkish embassy is what they've done throughout the planet in the Yemen war. They killed thousands. And they have had uh, not much coverage because of the atrocity in Yemen. Yes, uh, this happens in the Turkish embassy and uh, the mask falls from Trump and uh, Israel versus Iraq. When they saw what, when we see what they did at that embassy, they, this is what they do all the time, but the, now Israelis take distance and now they are silent because they sold the Saudi in the United States as the alternative versus Iran. Now that we're surrounding with growing Arab countries with better weapons, 
terminar pegado. Saudi Arabia is a great ahora, ally. Ahora contamina. Entonces toma distancia. But pero now it contaminates. Trump se but Trump en el, eh, en el, is la persona acting que lleva las relaciones differently de los en los from Israel. Es el, es el tipo it, que lleva las relaciones el Trump que uh, trata performs de the public relations of the Saudis in the United cree, States. Ni siquiera los republicanos He makes unbelievable secreto. statements. Bueno, esto, si no fuera... Tan dramático, If it weren't culero, as dramatic, uh, this could be a soap opera. I thank you very much for your pedagogy. Eh, I feel honored for you y accepting coming here. And I want you to, quieras, to promise that uh, each time you, you are here, you share Muchas your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. ¿Cómo? Muy bien. Y ponga usted de las cámaras, señor director.